So thank you guys for joining me on stage. Uh, there are four of us from four different parts of the banking and financial services uh, sector. Uh, so I think it will be quite interesting to um, get everyone's views on um, what you know, a concept like plat platformless might mean in that, uh, in that setting. Uh, so before we go into you know, all of that, um, I thought just to you know, get ourselves going, I'll just ask a very um, general question from the three of you. Um, in your opinion, uh, what do you think um, holds banks back uh, today from providing really cool custom experiences at speed and at scale? Do you want to go first? Dita? Not paying us enough money? <laughs> <laughs> no, um, <clears throat> you know, it, 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 in, in banking, I mean, it, it's, again, it's like all of our businesses, really. It, it, it's balancing risk appetite with innovation, you know, for me at the end of the day, you know, you, you can dream up all sorts of stuff, but I mean, it, it, it's difficult in a bank to get that stuff to, to fruition from time to time, you know, because there's so much stuff you've got, you got to go through, but, um, but I think it's changing a lot. I think even inside banks, I think, you know, it was certainly ours, as you saw, um, the, the guys are preparing to take more risk, et cetera. They're moving with the times, you know, those old gray men that you used to have are not as prevalent in some of these big banks anymore. So I, I certainly think it is, it is, it is improving. And again, you know, using sort of third party partners um, like WSO2 or other big you know, um, AWS, uh, et cetera, that definitely helps, you know, because um, we, we can use as a service. And, and we, we actually are a big, big believer in as a service. You know, if we don't have to build it and there's someone else who can do it for us, it's better, crikey, you know, bring it along. You know, and that certainly does help as well from an innovation point of view. Yeah. Thank you. Was it? Yes, um, I, I think from my perspective, I think a lot of it is continues to be around security. Um, we've had a lot of, um, over the years, I mean, a number of instances where we've, we're looking at the data and how it's being protected to ensure, you know, that, that from that aspect. Also, you know, for us, we, we integrate with over 5,000 financial institutions. So it's that's complexity because not everyone is going to be the same. So we try really hard to modularize them, centralize them, and, and, and make them as common as possible. Um, and then I think the I think the only other piece is, you know, we've been very restricted on, on our ability to put certain services in the cloud. Um, we've been having to have a lot of our information on-prem and build out processes for things like disaster recovery and so on. So those are some of the things that I have seen a lot of, of the larger FIs kind of move towards cloud and give us more feasibility into that. But if we have you know, such a large number that, that aren't willing to do that, then it's, it's a little more troublesome for us. But uh, I think that's, that's generally what I've been seeing. Thank you. Yeah, it's, it's a really interesting question, Sashi. Like, um, I'll kind of go back to what DTS said in his talk, right? Like when you think about a bank, it's all about a trust, yeah. right? And and it's I don't think we give enough credit to the big banks and, and the financial institutions because and the, the little banks and the little banks. I'm sorry. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> the, the the thing is, these are the oldest institutions in the world, yes. and they have so much technical debt yes. that they have to uh, roll low and modernize while keeping the trust, right? So, so when you think about that, uh, I, I think that's probably, if, if you think about like what's holding them back, that is how do you modernize while keeping the trust? That is the whole concept of why, why they can't go so much fast because they have, they have that obligation for their customers, right? So, so when I think from my point of view as a vendor, uh, how do we support these customers to innovate faster, right? Giving those tools, giving those platforms, uh, how do we give, give environments so they can create like, parallel executions, parallel um, uh, like environments to do certain experiments, like create those uh, trust environments in parallel so they can run it, experiment, and then expose those uh, experiences to customers, like customer 360 kind of experience, new AI uh, services, new ways of providing security, new ways of providing single sign-on, giving a unified experience, those kind of things. So um, what's holding back? I. I, th I think all these technical uh, people in these uh, in these institutions are doing quite a bit of work. Um, so, so uh, native load. Oh, exactly, cognitive <laughs> load, right? So, I think as vendors, it's it's our responsibility as well, giving the best of the breed tools so they can go faster and provide that trust for the customers. 
Just, just to add on what Mohan said, I, I had an interesting, so I, I used to work for many, many years in, in a very, very large bank, um, a, a global bank. And um, I actually had breakfast with one of my old colleagues, he's, you know, he's one of the group executive of the bank, and, and he was also, he was being pushed by the board of the bank to actually start working with fintechs more, to be more innovative and, you know, show a bit more flair, et cetera. And they actually ended up actually going back to the board and saying, no, um, it affects our trust too much. So we can't trust the fintechs will be performing at the level that our customers expect from our brand. So a lot of these big banks are also just saying, listen, guys, let's keep this thing tight and hard. So th they are quite still sensitive to where they're going to go from an experimentation point of view with fintechs and with some of the lighter things. That, that word trust is so critical to them, you know, so... It's, it's, it's a big word. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, I have my own uh, <clears throat> sort of perspective on it because I've been working a lot on open banking over the years. And um, I mentioned to Hossein today that, you know, when open banking took off, you know, we were preaching about opening up and, you know, sharing data, enabling value addition and, um, you know, putting an end to screen scraping and all of that. But the banks freaked out because... and and. Fairly, because, you know, over the years they've been uh, expected to, uh, you know, guard the, data, the very data that we were now asking them to open up to the world. Uh, and that was their mandate. And then suddenly we were kind of saying, oh, no, no, just open everything up. So uh, sometimes I think we also kind of, I mean, we are in technology. We love to bring in new concepts uh, uh, to, in the hope of making things better. But I think especially within the banking financial services, we have to be very careful that we don't um, sort of um, <clears throat> mess with that trust uh, and also with many of the regulations that the sector is governed by. The, the, just to add to that, right, that the thing is, whenever there are new technologies, uh, yes, there'll be so many possibilities, but there's also new ways to exploit, new ways to do fraud, right? Yeah. When you are a financial institution, you have to account for all those things and, yeah. you know, close those doors yeah. so you can innovate as well as, you know, not fraud will not happen, that assurance. Yeah, yeah. Um, <clears throat> so, um, I mean, Hussein, you mentioned that, you know, many of your financial institutions are, you know, they require you to be on-prem uh, while some of the larger, uh, larger ones have gone to the cloud. So um, <clears throat> I'm interested to understand how does platform engineering work uh, when a lot of these things are on-prem and does that kind of, like, is, is, is that also something that holds things back? Certainly it is. I mean, excuse me. I think it, it is something that slows us down quite a bit um, because we're very focused on not just the development. We've got to look at the infrastructure. We've got to look at the sizing. We've got to handle and look at a lot of the things with other teams from our infrastructure, from our netcom and things like that to ensure that we're load testing. Uh, when you're on-prem, you have to make sure that, that, that your application and your services can, can grow and stabilize and not have issues. Um, and I think, you know, for, for when you talk about financial institutions, they're very critical about response times and stability. Mm. And anytime you run into issues with that, it's certainly a big deal. And that's something, it's like a deal breaker. Um, we've got, you know, extensive processes around, you know, situations where we run, where we have incidents and we have to, you know, provide a lot of detail to our clients around, you know, why did you have this instance? Why do you have that issue? You know, and so on. And I think that's, part of the problem with our inability to put things in the cloud because we're not able to leverage some of those newer technologies that, that you know, auto, auto grow and things like that. Uh, it's one of those funny things. I think you cursed, no, it doesn't matter what you do, you cursed, you know. Yeah. But there, there are some, our, our bank, as you've heard, is all in the cloud. Yeah. And not as it all in the cloud, we also use SaaS providers as well. Yeah. And so we actually have to glue all of that SaaS and cloud all together yeah. and make it work Right. Really well. Yeah. Like everything must be firing on all cylinders, all APIs responding beautifully in that distributed ecosystem. Yeah. So I sometimes pray for, hey, imagine I just had like all my servers in one <laughs> building with wires between them. I can look at them. <laughs> right, right. I understand the other side of the coin. It also becomes, you know, they, it limits you as well. So, you know, it's, yeah. a, it's a huge trade-off. But point is, I'd rather be in the cloud than not is the truth. But, yeah. <laughs> yes, yes. The grass is always greener, right? Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, so, Nuan, uh, I mean, to kind of talk about that, that, that whole um, uh, sort of nervousness from moving out of on-prem to uh, the cloud <clears throat> and with the work that you've been doing. Um, I mean, like, um, 
have you seen some you know things that work some best practices or some you know things that you can use uh, to help financial institutions get that confidence to move to the cloud to uh, kind of benefit from you know everything that the cloud then entails yeah yeah so so some of the work that i've done with you know previously in ws2 and now in aws is like helping the financial institutions to build that foundation that secure foundation uh, where there's the right guardrails are in place the right governance structure is in place right security structures are in place so uh, the regulations can be applied or the compliance can be applied into that platform any in a in a at a foundational level so you don't have to uh, touch those things at a workload level so when you move a certain workload from a data center to the cloud you don't have to do it for every workload you handle all that in that platform or the foundation uh, and once you build that it is easier for you to maybe sometimes you lift and shift certain workloads maybe sometimes you modernize those workloads into the cloud right so depending on the situation sometimes you need the speed uh, so you lift and shift right if you have the secure foundation you don't have to worry about it uh if there are certain workloads because in certain banks you have mainframes right sometimes you can't you can't lift and shift mainframes you have to modernize those mainframe workloads and then move to the cloud right so um so i think most of my work and and my team's work has been spent on like building those foundations so the compliance and the guardrails can be applied really fast and seamless way just to some interesting stories of this cloud in banking um so to, to take Vietnam or Philippines, even South Africa, um, all of our banks, we actually, the, the, the data centers and the cloud provider we use, they're not even in the country, they're in another part of the world. Yeah, right. but, but the regulators have become comfortable with that, but we still have to bring back data, customers' names and all of that data and their balances, we have to bring that back onto local soil. Yeah. You know, it's absolutely critical and, and they actually audit that and check that off, you know, that you are bringing back that stuff. I mean, that's one. The second thing is what's quite interesting and in sitting in the US is the countries we operate in, they will not allow us to use US cloud mm. uh, on the US soil because there's not enough data protection and privacy in, mm. in, in the US world, whereas Europe and that part of the world has all got their GDPR and all that stuff, you know? So, so they're happier there. So we were allowed to put data there. So it's quite a complex sort of regulatory mix. And, and, and then another extreme story, we, we actually got an um, old, um, Donald Trump was president of the US a while ago, well, quite a while ago now, um, at that stage, um, we actually got an opportunity um, to do some work with Egypt. And Egypt said, well, why don't you come in and start a bank here? Because they also got a large unbanked population. And we said, cool, we, we can come do it. And our model is, guys, um, we, we use AWS Cloud. And even AWS have got a, um, a data center in Bahrain, which also is an Arab community. But the Egyptians said, there's no ways our citizen data is in the American cloud with Donald Trump sitting there. No ways. <laughs> so it's kind of weird. But I mean, but, but so there's all of these geopolitical stories yeah. as well as, yeah. you know, the, the end of regulatory stuff. So it's quite a soup and a mix of, of, of bits and bobs. But yeah, that's some of the stuff. Yeah, that's really interesting. I mean, some of the times the, the, the biggest hindrances from, you know, moving to the cloud or opening up data or going into a platform that's experienced uh, is often like these other things like, you know, culture and, you know, geopolitical <laughs> ch challenges of boundaries, right? It's really, uh, or, or the banking regulations. Um, so it's, I suppose it's really important to kind of acknowledge that and be aware of that when you kind of work with, uh, you know, new concepts like this. Um, so talking about the, the countries that you were talking about, uh, Dieter, um, especially with your work in emerging markets, um, I would imagine affordability is, a, is, you know, vital for, you know, your uh, yeah. technology process and structure and strategy. Uh, so what kind of impact do you think platformless engineering can bring uh, into that affordability and cost effectiveness equation? Yeah, I'll answer it in two ways. Um, well, the first way I'll answer it has got nothing to do with platformness, so apologies. Yes. But, but you know, you're talking about emerging markets, you know, and, and we, we do try hard to build like high quality apps, you know, like proper apps, you know, that you're proud of, et cetera, et cetera. 
in emerging markets, there's obviously, you know, a lot of this people in some of these emerging markets, they can't afford like the new iPhone or the new Google Pixel or whatever it is. These guys are getting these phones shipped in there that are, can only have three apps on the phone because they've got no, no, there's no like storage space in the thing. You know, the, the, the cameras are so horrible, they can hardly even work. Mm. And so, so even when we do try and engineer, we've got to engineer the smallest possible code and package. So we become so sensitive to the SDKs and all of this stuff because in every second supplier has got an SDK. Just stick it in, stick it in. Mm -hmm. Next thing you've got like a 50 gig download you know, for an app. But we have to balance that quite carefully, you know. And then the, the speed of the process in the phone is crap. So, so, you know, the emerging markets world is a funny one. You're trying to get a great experience, but you've got constraints. Yes. So, I mean, that, that's the one side, which is just an interesting story. But on, on, the, on the platform list, at the end of the day, there's actually two sets, to, there's two aspects to it. I mean, one thing which we can't get away from in life, and I'm just going to talk about very quickly, is all, all partner suppliers charge in USD. I mean, it's common sense, but you know, when your domestic currency is, you know, does this to the USD every day, you know, your, your costs are <laughs> changing every day as well. So that's also a bit of a tricky one. And the local people are earning like nothing compared to the USD, you know, so that's, that's an aside. But the, 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 the key point is the, the, the fewer engineers, so, so long story, if, if we have to do everything ourselves, we need more engineers. It's as simple as that. Yeah. Now, if we can rely on partners with proper platformless approaches, et cetera, like AWS have done, like you guys are doing, et cetera, that helps us just reduce our actual headcount. And ultimately, the sum of all your headcount mm. is ultimately your biggest, biggest expense in a bank. It's by far. So if you can just get that number under control, um, that translates into a cost-effective banking uh, proposition. You know, we charge less money for them. It's simple as that. Fantastic. Um, so, uh, Hossein, like, you know, when I read up about Harlan Clark, like, you guys do a lot of different things, right? You guys do uh, payment services, uh, marketing services, security solutions. Um, so, um, I was just wondering, um, like, given that, that, you know, wide range of focuses that you have, uh, how would something like a platformless experience help you to unify that uh, and you know become more efficient uh, within the solutions, the, the wide range of solutions that you provide to your clients. I, um, <clears throat> I think there's a couple aspects. I mean, I think the platformless concept or, or or process. I mean, it really reduces the amount of resources that are required that support a lot of the infrastructure. Um, that's that's. Very key. I mean, it's probably the same for everybody. Yeah. I know for us, it would be key. I mean, the, the other, I guess, concept or, or, I guess, situation that we run into on our side is today, as we build a lot of these systems, and a lot of them are complex systems, um, we have our developers and our engineers that, that build, you know, the features and the requests. And then we also have to deploy them. We have to release them. Um, and then we have to work with various teams on how do I configure this application? How do I tune this application? And, you know, and then we have to go through and ensure that we can maintain, you know, those high KPIs to our, or the SLAs of making sure our system availability is at 99.9% .9 and so on. So with that, I think that's probably the, the biggest opportunity I would see for us if we could continue to push more um, more in that direction, I do feel like that would be huge cost savings. If not, I could, you know, have more engineers to build up more features. So it really, I mean, there's two ways, right? You either save money by not having to have a, a lot of different infrastructure, network, database people, and then really just focus in on the application development. Mm. Yeah, so it's interesting that you mentioned, like, you know, you know, helping engineers understand, okay, how do I configure this thing? And, you know, and it, it depends on how big your teams are, how specialized they are, right? So, Nuan, uh, like, I mean, you've probably worked with a, um, uh, a varied um, sect of uh, different financial institutions with, you know, like, different budgets and different capabilities. So, um, I'm interested to know how some of the mid-sized um, financial institutions that don't have the luxuries of, you know, huge budgets and uh, large specialized teams. How do they today tackle, you know, this difficult platform maintenance, uh, this task of maintaining platforms? Right. So it's, <coughs> there are multiple ways you can think about it. Like, the cost optimization is always in mind when you are moving to a cloud-based kind of a platform. So 
how do you design a platform that is optimum from the cost point of view? You call it like FinOps, mm -hmm. like like DevOps. You also from the day one you think about FinOps, like what is our financial model in running this platform? Mm -hmm. uh, whether there's a seasonality to your transactions, then how do you spin off new instances? If the seasonality is predictable, how can I have reserved instances those time frames? Mm -hmm. Like if if you are a customer of AWS, if you know your demand, you can have certain certain servers or instances uh, reserved for you, which is at a much lower cost, right? So that way you can model your uh, finances and you can control it and it's much more predictable. So that's that's from one side, right? The, the other side is um, when you go back a little bit in time, uh, when you have on-prem data centers, uh, your responsibility is in your central IT team. The security, the governance, all that stuff, that whole responsibility is with your IT team. Now, when you think about like a platform-less kind of approach or going to cloud kind of approach, that responsibility is going to get split. And in the AWS world, you call it the shared responsibility model. And that shared responsibility will be basically the shared between the vendor who's maintaining the platform for you and partly for you because you are building some applications on top of that platform. Uh, now, what's happening over time is that that responsibility is more and more is going to go down to the platform providers. Like at, at, at the base level, AWS is in taking care of all the servers, reliability of it, security of it, patching security and all that stuff, right? And then if you're using a product like WSO2 on top of AWS, it's another layer of abstraction. Mm, yes. uh, so you, you push down your responsibility even a little bit more to WSO2-like platform. So now you don't have to worry about those kind of like DevOps kind of practices, right? Now you have now you have the time and the energy and the resources to really uh, invest on the business impact applications. So that way you don't have to spend too much money on those other things that is not differentiating for your business. So that way you can optimize too. Just, just as I was talking, there's two other things popped in my head. And these are all pain. I'm, I'm in banking, as you all know, and this is real pain. But um, patching, and all that stuff. Yes. I don't know if you guys know, but as banks, we have to actually take out insurance policies for cyber attacks. Mm -hmm. uh, um, you know, so we got that. But these guys come in and audit from time to time. If you if you're not patching at a certain level, a certain frequency, mm. you know, you, you avoid your insurance policy, you know, or your premium skyrocket. Right. Right. And so it's all of this guff, you know. So the less of that you got to do, oof, you know, the happier I am, you know. And then the other one is also a bane of our lives is internal audit. I mean, yes. the, you know, I don't think, I mean, I'm you know, not so young anymore, but every single year there's audit items with user access. Oh, my God. You know? And so the fewer systems that people have to maintain user access yeah. in, the happier we all are, you know? Yeah, yeah. So it, it's, 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 it all just drag and cost and everything, you know? So, yeah, yeah it yeah. yeah. helps. All right, so I think I've been hogging uh, <laughs> the questions to uh, the speakers, and I'd like to give an opportunity for you guys to also, you know, expand this panel sort of. So if you have any questions uh, for our panelists, now is the time. Or oh, I could just keep asking them questions. Okay. <laughs> I'll keep asking questions. <laughs> um, I can hear a tuba. Can you hear a mm, tuba? Someone practicing. <laughs> um, okay, let me get my thoughts together. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, I think Jose and uh, Dieter, you both spoke about uh, a little bit of open banking in your presentations. And uh, Jose, and, you know, we spoke about it as well. Um, <clears throat> what kind of, I mean, this is just an open question to all of you guys. Uh, what kind of um, impact do you think uh, a concept like platformless engineering can have on open banking ecosystems where you're, you know, on, on top of your day-to-day, -day, um, you know, practices and transactions, you are also um, collaborating with, you know, so m an ecosystem of other providers, opening up data, um, managing content management, uh, and all of those things. Uh, what kind of impact do you think plat like you know, platformless engineering or platformless experience uh, can have in an open banking ecosystem or an open data ecosystem? Um, <laughs> so, you know, API, you know, but at the end of the day, for me, you know, as a bank, you can open up an API, obviously. Mm. 
you hit that thing, but there's so many other little subtleties around the API. For example, you know, you need to be able to throttle that thing. You know, if it's a payment API and you've got a whole payment system inside, you can't have a supplier coming in and being a bad actor and bring down your payment thing. So the ability to add throttling, the ability to add all of that other stuff, you know, um, monetization of, of things that go through and that, all, all of that stuff. So certainly from a sort of platformless perspective, you know, that's what we look to. Mm -hmm. and, and that continual evolution of that, the investment in the platform that keeps on coming. And it's just one of those things that, you know, our, our teams are a bit more hand off, hands off on. You know, so, so to me, you know, that, that's really what it is, you know. Um, you know it's, and also the other thing about if you just pick a, open banking as an example, you know, that's a, it's going to be rolled out one of these years pervasively across all markets. And, you know, as consuming a platform like that, you're getting the learnings and practice of everybody, you know, at the same time. Yes. You know, so that's what's an advantage. Oh, it's, it's, it's just certainly the, the way, you know, we are going to go. There's no doubt about it. Any thoughts, Hussein? Um, uh, any of the um, financial institutions that you work with, um, do any of them practice open banking, in, in like in the true sense of open banking, yeah, up data with I, I haven't worked with any that, that do today, unfortunately. Um, that might be just the nature of our relationship with our financial institutions. Mm -hmm. I mean, we primarily are providing services to their customers and mm -hmm. the branches to, right. to enable check ordering and things like things like that. So we're kind of that's where that, that's kind of where we do business with with the with the banks today. Yeah, right. Do you want to add anything, Nguyen? Yeah, sure. I I think so. So my my experience is predominantly coming from U.S. financial institutions. So in U.S., I don't think it is as popular as in Europe, open banking, the concept as uh, open banking, but, but the, the practices of open banking is there in almost all U.S. financial institutions, like exposing that data as APIs, like, like interconnecting financial institutions, like payment systems with banks, capital market systems with you know payments or data providers and things like that, right? So I have seen so many of those institutions implementing those APIs, um, either using like a tool like WS2 API Manager or like uh, in AWS, like native AWS functions like Lambda functions, exposing through AWS Gateway, exposing it, it to their customers, right? What I've seen with the developers is it's a very seamless experience for them. They don't think about the platform. Yes. What they think about is the feature and the, and the product that they're going to release mm. in the time frame that they want to release it, right? For example, if you're doing like credit rating checks with Experian or something like that, if they want like a specific API, a specific API product, and there's a time bound situation, they want to expose it. They think about the business uh, requirement, and then they have a set of tools that they can use from the platform provider that they have chosen, and they implement it very quickly and release it to the uh, release it to their customers. And that platform they use provide the security governance discoverability, throttling, like details uh, talked about, all that seamlessly for that API product. So, But you know, just, just as the last point on this thing, you know, for me, open banking, you know, it's no similar, it's not real that different to any high quality developer portal. You know, so if you look at the people now in our teams, they often want to go and sell as well. They, they sell our APIs. There's a whole sales cycle there, but then you've got to onboard the, the party, you've got to exchange API keys, and then they've got questions, they want good documentation. You know, so, so ultimately to me, you know, that's also something we want out the box effectively from the platform, yes. you know, to put it up front there so we don't have to worry about that stuff, you know, so that's certainly all part of it as well, you know, so yeah, it, it, it's definitely something that, you know, so, so I, I often see open banking very similar just to a, a high quality um, developer portal. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so I mean, with the kind of the evolution of open banking across the different regions, um, we've seen how the standards have evolved as well, right? So we, st like the standards came in, um, in, in the UK and then Australia and Brazil and the Middle East, but now it's kind of converging. Mm. A lot of the standards are converging. Yeah. So that is also then it becomes uh, an out of the box experience yeah. that you yeah. can kind of hide it within so, that platform. I don't way. know if anyone's from the UK here, but um, for example, Apple Pay, yeah. um, we, we all use Apple Pay, da -da, tap, tap, et cetera. But in the UK, they've implemented open banking to your actual bank account balance. Okay, So if you use Apple Pay in the UK, Apple have done a thing where they actually go and check your balance. So after you've made the payment, also on your Apple device, it shows you in Apple Pay what your balance is after the transaction. Oh, wow. so by the open banking. So it gets quite sexy how you can bring all the stuff yeah. together. You know? But yeah, so, but as I said, Europe is, is, is definitely pushing it a lot harder. Yeah. I think they did the same thing when they released the Apple credit card, mm. the Goldman Sachs. They had that same API experience. When that, you yeah, pay yeah. from the Apple credit card, you can see all the transactions, yeah. the points you get and all that. It's a yeah. much seamless experience. 
Okay, guys, so I think we are almost out of time. So I want to just ask one last question, and you can only answer in, in like one sentence. <laughs> That's the deal, right? <laughs> um, and this is, this is a different question. It has nothing to do with platforms, engineering, or anything like that. Um, what's the one area uh, in, in the banking sector uh, that you think will have the biggest impact uh, of AI in, in the future? Stop that, son. Mm, yeah, stop it. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think it's custom experience. Sorry. Custom experience. Okay. One, one. Oh, yes. You want me to explain right. it? <laughs> no, what I meant, that, meant by that is like when you, when you interact with a bank, there are multiple ways you interact with the bank. There's you, you, you probably buy a car and you have a car loan. You have a mortgage, you have your checking account, savings accounts, and all that, right? Long sentences, eh? <laughs> Do, yeah. Uh, so custom experience from what I meant there is like connecting all that and providing like a unified experience. Um, so that will have a lot of AI-based uh, Great. Back there. You're saying? I think for us, where we're already starting to see some is in the contact center, where in the contact center specifically where somebody wants to know the status of their order and or other things like that, where's my order, things like that, where those could be potentially, you know, very seamlessly automated responses and things like that. So I kind of think contact center is probably a big area for, for fi financial institutions. Interesting. Costs. Get rid of the humans. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Biggest cost out there. Shareholders are happy. There you go. <laughs> Thank you, guys. This has been a really um, interesting conversation. Uh, and thanks, everyone, for joining. And I hope you, um, you know, had some fun along the way and, try, you know, in, all of us trying to figure out where this platformless experience fits in within the, you know, very regulated, very strict banking financial services sector. Um, there is going to be a birds of a feather session uh, happening around open data. So we talk about open banking, open healthcare and the open data uh, stuff um, uh, in Salon West, I think, uh, meeting room two. Uh, so I'll be in that. So if you guys want to just follow me there, I'll be happy. Thank you. Thanks, Ishni. <laughs> Thanks, Thanks everyone. everyone.